you for participating. Thank you for participating in this really important uh, documentary and panel discussion afterwards. And I love seeing the comments. Um, one I really appreciated was anybody seeing this film would want to get rid of those dams right away. And that's the way I'm feeling right now too. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists tonight. And I'm going to start with uh, Stephen Hawley, a journalist from Hood River, Oregon, who is the author of Recovering a Lost River and the writer and co-producer of this documentary that you just watched, Dam to Extinction, that depicts, depicts the plight of the salmon dependent killer whales. Thank you, Stephen, for joining us and thank you for your marvelous film. We also have with us tonight, Tony Jones, who is an Idaho native, attended graduate school at the University of Washington, where he received his uh, MA in economics. Mr. Jones maintains Rocky Mountain Echo Econometrics, an economic consulting company that specializes in environmental issues with particular emphasis on energy and the impact of hydroelectric dams on salmon and the environment. Clients include Idaho Rivers uh, United and the National Wildlife Foundation. Thanks, Tony, for being with us. Jim Waddell is a civil engineer with a 35-year career in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. He held the highest civilian position in the Corps' Walla Walla District as Deputy District Engineer for Program Management. He oversaw seven major hydro dams, including the Lower Snake River dams. As founder and director of Dam Sense, he continues analysis and educating with concise knowledge about these dams with a background not found elsewhere. During his distinguished career, he was the senior policy analyst for the environment in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Jim also serves in elected position as a public utility commissioner in the Clallam County, in Clallam County, Washington. And thanks, Jim. Uh, Heather Nicholson is an electric cooperative owner in the San Juan Islands. She's engaged civil, civically and with other advocates on the solvability of breaching the lower Snake River dams, which is the most significant uh, required action to stop the extinction of critically endangered whales and their wild Chinook salmon food source. Thanks, Heather, for being with us. Let's see, did I miss somebody? Oh, Scott Levy is an activist and volunteer, filmmaker, adventurist, and outdoor enthusiast. He has a BS in mechanical engineering from UC Berkeley. Scott has dedicated the last 23 years of his life to studying the effects of the Lower Snake River dams on our environment and the consequent climate change effects. Mitigation for their removal is easy. According to Scott, repairing a collapsing ecosystem is not. So once again, thank you all for joining us. And I just want to remind our participants to stay muted this evening. If you would like, you can turn your video back on now that we're done with the movie. So our panelists can feel like they're talking to some real people. Uh, we'll be asking a number of questions submitted by participants when you register. And um, I'm going to direct these questions kind of openly to the panelists. Uh, they seem to want it that way. So they'll just decide amongst themselves who's going to answer which of these questions. I, you've put some additional questions in the chat, and we're going to try to get to those as well. But we want to make sure that we have time for all those that have already been submitted and also have time for a call to action. So um, I'm going to start the questions with. Uh, this one. So can, can one of you explain to the audience tonight, what's the difference between breaching and removal of the dams? And uh, why is breaching what it seems to be that you all are, um, are promoting? And how long would this process take? And just go ahead and unmute your, you can go ahead and all stay unmuted if you want. Okay, I'm unmuted, I think. Um, yeah, that's exactly what we studied in Walla Walla during this feasibility study back in the 90s and early 2000s. And what we discovered in the Corps of Engineers, not discovered, figured out, calculated, 
was that you do not need to remove all the structure of the dam. That means you don't need to remove the powerhouse, the spillways and the locks. That's all solid concrete steel and everything. And it would cost in the billions to do that. We, we calculated though, by removing the earthen berm part of the dam, each dam has an earthen berm, um, you could create a channel wide enough for the natural river to flow through and achieve salmon passage uh, for adults coming upstream. So it was, and that turned out to be a lot cheaper. And in fact, the cost of removal of the um, uh, earthen berm today and full mitigation, which is the same kind of stuff that uh, Simpson has talked about and Inslee and Murray in this re recent document they came out with between 10 and 27 bill, billion dollars. No, that's, that's way out of line. Those are unsupported figures. The real cost based on the Corps of Engineers and some work we've done with other Corps folks in the meantime to update those numbers is about 250 million to breach all four dams and about maybe four or 500 million in mitigation for rail uh, enhancements, irrigation um, pumps and stuff like that that needs to be done to take care of the farmers that are impacted because their shippers are irrigated in a few other kind of categories. Now, how long does that take? Breaching the earthen berm is really fast. It's done hydraulically by just simply cutting a notch in the dam as you lower the water um, you know, through the, uh, uh, the spillways. And as you drop the water level, you cut a, a notch with a bulldozer in the earthen berm. When you get about halfway down, you're at a point where you can let the water through and literally blow the rest of the, of the uh, uh, earthen berm out and have no downstream impacts on anything from flooding or anything. Um, now, all that can be done very quickly. And the, the actual breach only takes about 45 days from the time you start digging to the time the breach is, the, you got a free flowing river. Procedurally, there's about three months worth of work the Corps would have to do to notify people to get things set up and so forth like that. Contracting is really simple. You rent a bulldozer or two. Um, they're just, and there's no design because this is a, an earthen berm removal that was already feasibility. The feasibility was studied in the original report. So if we were to get the White House to put the pressure on the Corps today or within the next month or two, there is still time to breach by, you need to do the breaching in de between December and March for fist passage reason. We could get it done this year, get it started, breach two, one or two dams this year, easy to do. Wow. Yeah, I added uh, in the chat a link to a YouTube video that uh, somebody from Dam Sense uh, did in hydraulic modeling. So you all can go look at that. Thank you. And we'll be uh, saving the chat and saving the resources that people are putting in the chat and uh, getting that to, out to all participants after the video. Do any I, others? Um, I can also point out that on the same website is a document called the Plan um, Breach and Mitigation uh, Plan. And it gives those numbers I just discussed. Great. Anyone else have a comment on breaching versus Removal. Okay, uh, next question. Um, why are we just talking about removing the four lower Snake River dams? Um, I know I haven't really heard anyone talking about removing the four dams on the lower Columbia. I live in the Dalles, so we've got a dam here. Uh, why is the focus on the Snake River dams? Well, I, I let other people chime in on this one too, but the short answer is that was studied. The Corps of Engineers looked at that back 20 years ago when they started the analysis. They did an operations review of the whole basin and concluded that um, several things. Economically, the four dams on the Columbia River have a much more higher economic value than on the Lower Snake, which have virtually no economic value when you understand the benefit versus the cost. Um, also, your biological benefit is far greater on the lower snake because you've got so much juveniles being killed, um, you know, in the turbines, passage over the dams, high temperatures, predation, stuff like that. Um, and from an, and also from a hydropower standpoint, the um, you know it was those are the last four built in the system, and and those are the worst dams from a hydro standpoint because the river flows in the Snake River are just not enough to generate enough power when you need it the most, like in the summertime and in the wintertime. So that's why they were chosen. Um, there are some other folks that might want to chime in on that too. I'm going to take a, let's see, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to take the long view here and suggest to uh, our viewers that, you know, it's not too soon to start planning for the reason we want to take out the Snake River dams is those are the, the biggest bang for the buck. Um, they block access to uh, the largest swath of wilderness in the lower 48 that happens to contain thousands of miles of uh, intact salmon habitat. And it's high elevation habitat that we're gonna need, you know, as climate chaos descends further upon us. But, you know, the, there's an uh, economist and engineer on the panel, so they can back me up on this. The, the, the lifespan of concrete is about 60 years. And Bonneville has passed its 75th anniversary. That was, that was when the first two dams in the system were built. And the simple fact of the matter is that the utility industry, as Tony can maybe tell us more about later, is undergoing a massive transformation. And the, the old way of furnishing electricity where you have these massive generators and thousands of miles of wires and poles may not be the only way that we deliver electricity to consumers in the future. Uh, dams are going to become more of an intermittent resource as snowpack and rainfall become less reliable. And so here in the Pacific Northwest, where we rely to uh, a more significant degree than any other part of the country on hydropower, it's not too soon to start rethinking the whole system. We need to build in resiliency. We need to build in a diversity of resources, and we need to think about the way that power is delivered. You know, it's interesting for Washington people where, you know, BPA is being asked to come up with 400 megawatts to restart a aluminum facility up near Bellingham. And, and the Bonneville Power Administration is saying they don't have that electricity. And in the same breath, they export 10 times that amount of electricity to California every year. So where are the priorities? <laughs> uh, these are, you know, there are engineering questions and there are economic questions, but there are also really sticky political questions that uh, we need to confront as well. Scott? Yeah, I'd like to clarify a little thing that Steve said towards the beginning there about um, he mentioned that these dams are blocking access. It's, it's, it's not that they're blocking access like a, a dam that doesn't have a fish ladder. What, he, what he's trying to say is, is that the, the juveniles, the little guys that are born up here in Idaho where I am, uh, I'm not far from the headwaters of the Salmon River here, um, they head to the ocean. Well, when they get to the Washington border and they confront the first reservoir, the, the river stops. I mean, it, it's a lake and then they got to swim 37 miles, go over a hundred foot waterfall, another 40 miles, hundred foot waterfall. They got four dams and four very slow, slow moving reservoirs. And that's where a huge amount of mortality is happening. We're, we're killing probably 10 million salmon every year going down through the hydro system. And then another, uh, you know, of those that survive only 25% of them are, are unharmed by the effects. So the mortality has to do with the downstream passage. Yeah, one, one clarification on, on Steve, something you said, uh, the, the concrete will be a lot, will be around there a lot longer, but what, what you really are talking about is the steel structures, the mechanical systems like the turbines, the uh, lock gates, the spillways, those things have uh, pretty much all exceeded their life um, um, expectancy, and many of them have failed um, in, you know, in serious ways like lock gates and turbines. Correct. Lock gates are getting fixed just two months ago, right in the middle of the juvenile season. There were some problems. They had to drill some holes in there and put in some defriction stuff. And these they weren't they weren't designed for this lubricant. They were supposed to be dry. They're failing. Um, the turbines need to replace. We've replaced two of the twenty-four already, and well over expense. So it's interesting when you compare the cost of like let's let's put in a solar or wind or whatever for how much. Well, we should think about how much it's going to cost to refurbish these four lower snake river dams also. Yeah, and I guess one final point here, Bonneville Power recognizes the inefficiency and cost ratio of those dams. Now, they don't tell anybody, but if you look at their capital expense program, they are prioritizing 
the Columbia River dams, especially Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee, because those are the big money makers. They have the best return on investment. And I agree. Let's put our money on those dams and quit wasting it on Lower Snake because as ratepayers get into this thing and, you know, we we're losing money on the Lower Snake dams. Even today, where there's been the last 18 months or so, there have been relatively high secondary um, prices or um, you know, uh, prices available for secondary power, the surplus power. And so Bonneville has made some extra few hundred million in the last couple of years. But while the system made two or three hundred million, the Snake River dams were still losing money. So that's why they're not worth it. BPA knows that but they're just going to run them to failure, which will take 10 or 12, 15 years. And by then it'll be too late for salmon and orcas and ratepayers. Hey, thank you. I uh, want to talk a little bit about the path forward. So what do you see as the best path forward? I know we're hearing from some of these reports that more studies are needed, that negotiations are needed between all the stakeholders. Um, you know, it could drag on and on, or it could maybe take 45 days if we get our way. Um, if Murray and Inslee recommended breaching, would Congress act on it? This is kind of a combination of some questions that came up um, from the participants. And can the president issue a directive to begin breaching? So um, can you kind of talk to those questions and then also your thoughts and critiques on uh, the report that came out this week that was commissioned by Inslee and Murray. I'd like to ask Tony and Heather to weigh in on these. Yeah, well, let me just offer a preface to that question. And I think Jim Waddell will probably finish it for me. But back in 1999, the Corps of Engineers did a thing called the Drawdown Regional Economic Work Group. That was the first big study on the viability of the lower snake dams. <clears throat> and as the numbers were being collected, it was clear to everyone in the room that the dams were not economically viable, that the right thing to do was to breach them. That was 22 years ago. The numbers have only gotten worse since then. Back then, the Corps of Engineers chose to cook the books by limiting the amount of recreation money that they, that the best uh, recreation consultants in the country were concluding. The Corps of Engineers cut those numbers by about 60 to 80 percent. They also put in a zero benefit for the tribes. Now, I can understand why the tribes might not want to put a monetary value on their culture, but we all know that the benefit was way more than zero. So that's how the Corps of Engineers cooked the books back in the year 2000. And when I conveyed that information to my then boss, who was Dirk Kempthorne, the governor of Idaho, uh, my handler leaned back in his chair and said, that's about what we penciled out a couple of years ago. The point to that statement is when the studies are being done, they've known for 22 years. We don't need more studies. <laughs> We've studied and studied and studied and studied and the books have been cooked so many times. They, they are down to mush at this point. So we don't need more studies. We need action. We need a timeline. And as even the most recent Inslee and Murray report concludes, the fish are in trouble and the dams are killing the fish. The only question is, is how much are we willing to spend to save the fish and save the orca? Well, in terms of the way forward, um, I, I think you have to realize just based on what Tony said and what Steve's written about in his books and, and Scott too, is that this is a racket that's been going on in the Northwest for a long time between the politicians here um, certain environmental groups, the pro-dam crowd and so forth. And it's just become a self-perpetuating, self-catalyzing process of study, litigate, uh, negotiate, uh, meeting, you name it. It ain't gonna be solved in the Pacific Northwest. These are federal dams. The responsibility relies with the Corps of Engineers and the Bonneville Power Administration. And so to put pressure on them, the shortest route, the most direct route, and the most correct route is, is directly to the administration. 
And so the best thing to do is put pressure on the White House itself, not the Council for Environmental Quality, which is a little sub arm of the White House, who is managing part of the process right now, but to bypass them and go directly to the White House, the office of the president, and, and, and put pressure on him. Um, because And the other reason is a lot of people have been misled to believe that Congress needs to authorize breaching of these dams. That is simply not true. That is, in, that is a conflict with appropriation law to say that. The politicians know that. But just like um, as the hacks or the folks in Washington, D.C. know, if you if, what a, a senator or congressman will do to pacify a group of constituents on an issue is to promise a piece of legislation and they will put a piece of legislation out um, just like or a plan, just like uh, Simpson did or like Murray and Inslee are talking about here that might cost 10 to 27 million. But that's a poison pill. They know that would never be passed because the, the amount of money is too high, it's unsupported, the actual um, legality of the legislation would be called into question, and this one certainly is, and it was shot down even by the Public Power Council, a pro-dam group, when Simpson proposed the same thing, because it's, it's, it's illegal to propose, uh, to, to insist that the core has the authorization or, or does not have the authorization that Congress must do it. And so, yes, it's Congress can put pressure on the core, um, and that's always helpful, but it's not necessary. And we've learned we were not going to get the support out of our Northwest delegation. So just it's it's kind of like we're it's beating a dead horse. And I, I think people like Steve, well, everybody on the call goes back many years on this and maybe can add some more fire to it. Heather and I have met with the uh, both the CEQ people and the um, the people that did the Inslee Murray study and provided them tons of information and not a bit of that made it into that report. And they just ignored everything that a guy like myself and, and people like on this phone call have contributed over the years and others from government. I mean, Corps of Engineer employees have written stuff, um, you know, they're in the night behind the scenes and, and provided that to these politicians and they ignore it. Yeah, yeah so, um... Back to the question, there, there's a lot in that question. So what did I, what do I think of the Inslee Murray report? I haven't spoken to many people about this. Um, I, I found it was pretty good for the most part. It, it basically was a summary of the reports that have come out, basically three major reports and they assembled the information from there and they didn't really do much beyond that. Um, they got some quotes from people, but one of the big um, mistakes in there is they included this, Congress needs to authorize, which they don't. And I can go through several examples like Jim just did, but this is held in the executive branch. This is Army Corps of Engineers and the President of the United States that can make this decision. Now the water infrastructure of 2018 shows that, you know, a deauthorization list gets made by the Army Corps and then Congress has a, a veto right. The deauthorization isn't for a long time from now. This is just, we put it out of, you uh, know, a mothball state, you breach the dirt section, you keep the concrete. If for some reason the salmon don't come back, um, which would surprise 99% of everybody's scientists, you know, if you put the dirt back in, you got your dams back. So you don't deauthorize just yet, but the hands are definitely not in Congress. Uh, but the congressional people would like you to believe that. All right, thank you. Uh, so I've got a question for Heather here. Um, so can you kind of talk a little bit more? We saw it certainly in the film. Can you talk a little bit more about the relationship between the Snake River salmon and the orcas, the southern resident killer whales? And how much time do we have to save them from extinction? Thank you. Um, no more time. Um, we're in transition right now in terms of the Southern residents. It's, it's a teeter-totter either or. Uh, if, if we don't take drastic action, they're going extinct. That's where they're at. I talked with Ken Balcom today. I mean, I've spoken with him before and, you know, just checking for updates. Um, but uh, you know, both he and Dr. Deborah Giles, who's uh, they're they're both you know top Southern resident killer whale scientists. Um, 
well, Giles was in the movie as well. Uh, you know, they've both come to the point where um, <clears throat> if if the dams, if the if the Snake River Dam, the Lower Snake River Dams are not breached as quickly as possible, the Southern residents are not going to survive. That's it. End of story. Uh, and it's you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, this extinction has been underway for quite some time and we've been on this trajectory. So it's very easy to feel like we can kick the can or we can try something else. And well, no one's too sure. You, you don't see it happen immediately, but you know, there's, we're, we don't have any more time at all. So that's why I appreciate everyone doing everything that they can and appealing to the usual channels. Um, and I, I appreciate the challenges that everyone has in whatever role they may be in, whether that's uh, working at a utility or directing a utility or being in power planning or fish mitigation or just a person on the street, whoever you are. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think there are very many people who want to see the Southern residents go extinct. And we just, um, we have run out of options. And NOAA themselves uh, have determined quite some time ago, um, and we know from the, the large size of the population and the size of the, the Snake River Basin, that they are, they are among the top priority stocks for the Southern residents, there's no question and that breaching the dams is acknowledged as the biggest thing that we can do for, for these whales. Uh, and, and, you know, and Ken, he understands very well that we have to continue um, fixing habitat, doing all of the things in all of the other areas and rivers. We have to keep that moving up, up, up and, and hit it hard, but without breaching the Snake River dams, it won't be enough. So there's, there's just no question on that. Um, I, I bet Steve could, could answer um, probably better than me. So feel free to, to say what you got to say, Steve. Uh, I think you said it, the time is now. This has to happen as soon as it possibly can. So uh, that's why in addition to making this film, I'm always happy to hop on, you know, online screenings and panels like this to let people know that there's the, the uh, Biological deadline is far ahead of the political timeline at this point. Steve, if I can interject just a moment. Um, sure. One of the things I did not say in my introduction to your film is how other people in the public can get to view what we have just seen this evening. Uh, but I should tell you that Stephen and his director, Michael Pe uh, Peterson, were both very generous in allowing us access to their film for free. There is a paywall, but uh, Stephen, you should tell the, the audience here um, how they could go about watching the film if they wanna spread the word here. Sure, um, you can go to the film's website, www.damtoextinction.com. Um, and there's a paywall there. If you've got the bandwidth, the best, the highest quality video is on the Vimeo link on that website. Uh, if you don't have the bandwidth, you can also rent uh, the movie on Amazon Prime. Um, and if you are really a throwback and you want a DVD or a Blu-ray, contact me also through the film's website and I will send you one of those. It's funny because we get... <laughs> <laughs> we had one screening where, you know, one of these under 40 types looked at the DVDs that we had on display and they're like, what's this? So, you know, if you want one, let me know. I'll get you one. Let me, I'd like to add one uh, other point about the orcas and breaching. One of the really powerful things, the most important immediate thing that breaching does for the Southern residents is this. Each year, about 20 million Chinook salmon juveniles about this big are dumped into this lower Snake River or come through the lower Snake River, and up to half of those die in the Snake River. They never make it to the Columbia. Now, if you breach, you stop killing up to half of those. Maybe up to 10 million of those juvenile Chinook are, are not dead. 
but more than half of those will make it through the other dam and out into the ocean. And that is by far the fastest way you can get additional fish into the ocean to not only support orcas, but to support the whole ocean ecosystem, which is a part of the food chain in the ocean for everything out there. And it also, because the Snake River is the backbone of the Pacific Northwest salmon system, it, what it does, it builds up the entire system. So all of these other runs that are coming out of the Salish Sea, Strait of Juan de Fuca, the, the, the coastal estuaries and so forth, have a better chance of survival. And now there's time to do this, especially we've got good ocean conditions right now because we're seeing good salmon returns this year. Um, but if we don't take advantage of that by pumping a whole bunch of juveniles out there by breaching, then we're gonna lose this advantage we have right now in this good ocean conditions, which might only last one more year. Thank you. That was kind of one of my, uh, uh, essentially my next question about uh, how long would this take and, and um, do you see it being a long-term solution also for the orcas? And it sounds like the answer is yes. Well, yeah, I mean, in the short term is once those juveniles get out there, they'll be 14, 12, 14 pound fish within uh, 12 or 14 months. And so that nothing can can produce no habitat work, no um, stopping noises in the ocean. Nothing comes close to providing orca, I mean, salmon that fast to the ecosystem. Scott, go ahead. You're muted, Scott. I'd like to tie back real quick to what Heather said about that the science is clear that this is the best thing we could do for Idaho salmon. And Inslee's report um, that just came out said that quite plain. And that's the, the thing that the, the Save Our Dams Coalition is really wishing nobody had said. Thanks. Um, a couple of questions have come up in the chat that I want to make sure we get to too. And one of the questions is, and I know the film dealt a little bit with this, but what do you, you want to talk a little bit about our obligations to the tribes? And then also a little bit about the power replacement project that uh, some of the tribes are working on to replace the power that is um, being provided by the four lower Snake River dams right now. Yeah, go Take ahead, that, Tony. Tony. Are you muted? Oh, there we go. He's muted. Um, I would just like to talk about the replacement power real quick. Uh, back when the dams were being built, it took big utilities. It took, the, it took the federal government. It took a lot of effort to build things like lower snake dams, like Grand Coulee, like John Day and so forth. It took a lot of money. What it takes to replace the power these days is you float a thing called an RFP, a request for proposals. And the private sector comes running and all you say in the RFP is you say, I want 3000 megawatts of power. How much can you, when can you deliver it? And what will it cost? And the private sector comes out and builds you a wind farm or a solar farm or whatever. And they tell you how much it's going to cost. And currently, the cost of the power coming out of those things is $20, $25 a megawatt hour or something like that. Compare that to the $40, $45 a megawatt hour that the Lower Snake Dams produce power for. The point being, you can replace the Lower Snake Dams, get the fish back, and get a $20 megawatt hour bonus to, to, on, on the side. That's the cherry on the cake. The, the point I've been making for several years now is that economically, it makes sense to take out the lower snake dams, even if you don't care about the fish. Even if you don't care about the fish, it makes economic sense to take out the lower snake dams. Getting the fish and the orca back is the cherry on top of the ice cream cone. It's, it's time to do it. Uh, getting to the, the tribes plan, it's, it's kind of brilliant in its own way because people like me and Jim, Scott and others have been arguing for a couple of decades that 
you don't have to replace all the power of the lower snake dams because most of the power that the lower snake dams produce is produced when nobody needs it. It's produced during spring runoff and they don't produce much power during the summer peak or the winter peak. But it's the Corps of Engineers and Bonneville Power and other people say, oh, no, 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 you need a lot of power. Well, the tribe took that off the table. What the tribes are saying is, okay, tell us your number. I think it's 5,300 megawatt hours or something like that. The Corps of Engineers says that's how much power they make. And the tribe said, okay, we'll build it. Job done. Stop arguing. We'll build it. So that question is gone. There is no argument anymore over whether or not the lower snake dams can be replaced or how much power should be replaced. Because again, the tribes took that argument off the table. They said, we'll build the power, move on. Good for the tribes. I, I will also add that Bonneville Power and the Pacific Northwest Power and Conservation Council's modeling shows that you could easily take out at least two dams right now and you wouldn't even you wouldn't notice a blip in the power system. You could probably take out all four and not notice a blip because there's that much surplus floating around. Um, but certainly it's silly to sit here and argue and say, we need to like this uh, Murray thing supposedly says is we need to do all this before we breach the dams. No, no, you don't. Um, you're, you go ahead and get breaching at least two dams this or two dams this year and one or two the next year and so forth. And in any gaps that need to be filled up, which is very minimum, probably on the land, only on the fourth dam, Ice Harbor, for power, can, do you need to do anything? And so um, uh, I think that the other thing that happens is that once you take that, the instant you take that power off the transmission system, you open up grid space for a lot of renewables and battery storage and that kind of stuff. And so that's no longer a constraint, which is what Bonneville is doing is constraining renewables from getting on the grid. And this is a conflict of interest they have. They're marketing federal hydropower, hydropower, and they're, but yet they have, uh, they own 70 something percent of the transmission grid and they're dragging their feet and cost and telling people it takes a long time and a lot of money to do a study just to figure out if you can connect your solar winds or battery to the grid and and those studies are taking a lot of money and years to do and and the thing is they say well we don't have enough transmission capacity well if you take the snake river dams out that's three thousand megawatts of transmission space instantly freed up allow these renewables to come in and be co competitive, but BPA doesn't want to see that, obviously. But we, as ratepayers and as, as as citizens, so forth, we want to see that. <clears throat> can, I, can I? Can I? Let me just follow up really quickly. Okay. Uh, part of the part of the. In, am I muted? No, no, we hear you. You're good. Okay. Anyway, the the most recent Inslee Murray report was talked about replacing the dam, some of the infrastructure costs would be 10 billion plus. Uh, it's important to remember that if the tribes replace the power, the cost to replace the power is zero. The tribes will be fronting that money. And so the cost to replace the power is not 10 billion, it's zero. So good, good for the tribes. The tribes will make the profit off of it and God bless them. They've, it, it's long overdue for them. That's a great segue into Tony, what I was wanted to say, because there was a question here that all too frequently, I think it's kind of glossed over in discussions like this is what do we owe the tribes? And I think this is a really important question because it kind of gets into the soul and the conscience of our country, right? These tribes gave up thousands of acres of land in exchange for the right to hunt and fish in the usual and accustomed places. And those rights have never been completely fully honored. Initially, before the dams went in, there was a question of access. And then as the fish run started to dwindle, there was a question of their share of the harvest. And then when the dams went in, all those questions kind of got flipped onto the, their head because a lot of those usual and accustomed places are no longer there. And 
it is true that none of the treaties of 400 some odd treaties that the United States government signed have ever have ever been honored completely in their original form. But this is an instance where there's a double uh, indemnity, I suppose you could call it, because what those dams did is they created wealth for non-tribal people, Weyerhaeuser, Alcoa, uh, Boeing, and more recently, Facebook and Google and Microsoft. They've played a part in creating a massive amount of corporate wealth. And the tribes have enjoyed next to nothing of that. So I feel like people of conscience really need to make this not only an environmental rights issue, but a human rights issue. And we tried to make that clear in the film. And, you know, I, I think for a couple non-Indian guys, we, we took a stab at it, but it, there's more to that conversation that needs to happen. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see that, as Tony said, the tribes are taking the lead on the energy side. I think we should all be inspired by that and support it and, you know, amplify their voices any way we can. Thank you, Stephen. Scott? Yeah, uh, great response from all you guys. Um, the, the other thing is to remember is like, th this power is going to California. We get, there's like all the time is 4,000 megawatts going to California. Lower Snake produced like 780, like maybe a thousand. And I think the, the Inslee and Murray report was going with a thousand megawatts. So it's, it's not even being used in the region. Now, so the, Tony's right, you know, to cost to replace it is zero. I mean, it's already been replaced. There's, as Jim's pointed out, there's a, a long line of people trying to get their renewables on the grid. It doesn't cost anything. People are waiting in line to do it. The tribes have already stepped up to do it and there's more. Now, there's more than just the economic benefit and the salmon benefit and the orca benefit. Something that hasn't been discussed yet that you're gonna see is that the, the uh, carbon sequestration benefit, if you were to bring Idaho salmon back to Idaho's forest, the forest that has decayed because of the lack of salmon will, re will, will be restored. And the amount of growth will be the equivalent carbon sequestration of the entire output of the Pacific Northwest. I've asked people to check the numbers. It's, you know, the CQ, the Inslee people have it. They haven't talked about it. Be happy to send it to all you, anybody wants it, uh, redfishandbluefish.org. So not only are we saving money, we're gonna save the trees, we're gonna sequester 150, 200 million metric tons of carbon, which is huge, okay? It's, it's just a no brainer. There's like, oh, oh, we got to keep the dam so we can ship, ship grain 7,000 miles to the Philippines. That's why we're keeping them. Doesn't make sense. Um, I should also point out that the, um, they're, you know, these dams are touted as clean. Well, they're certainly not clean in terms of salmon impact, but they're also not carbon free in the sense that they produce methane because of the algae that grows in them in the summertime as the water heats up. This methane emissions is um, about 87, based on um, government funded studies by credible scientists, we've calculated that the um, methane emissions are about 87,000 metric tons over a hundred year life cycle. Now that's pretty, that's about the same as a, um, uh, a gas fired um, power plant. However, the key thing is that Methane is a short-lived gas, and most of its damage is done in the first 10 years. And so if you calculate the, test of the methane damage done in 10 years, so, so if you breached, you prevent 10 years worth of methane emissions from the reservoirs, your actual benefit in terms of carbon reduction or methane or global warming gas reduction is several, many times more than 87,000 metric tons. So now you're getting up there to equivalent of a coal plant worth of carbon emissions could easily be offset by breaching the, the low snake dams in terms of methane emissions. Heather. I just want to point out uh, to folks, I'm, I'm going to put a link in the chat, which I did way further up as well. But I, I prepared a, a Google Doc um, full of links of things that we're talking about today with references and so on. 
and I can keep adding to it, but I'm going to put that link in the chat. It's a Google Doc that's public. So anybody can go there and copy those links to get information. And um, throughout the rest of the discussion, um, I can add anything else that comes up. Um, this might be going out on a limb, but <laughs> I'm sort of a seize the day person, but um, my, my track is I'm a member of the public, okay? Jim is in the civil engineer, Tony's an economist, you know, Scott and Steve have their niche. I'm a member of the public and I don't want the Southern residents to go extinct or salmon. And so I'm, a, I'm a, an individual who's become engaged. Part of that engagement is attending the power planning meetings, talking to my utility, talking to whoever I can. If we have a member in the audience who is, who is a director of my utility and if he's interested and if you hosts are up for it, I would say it would be very interesting to um, have a little exchange if, if that sounds like something you guys want to do. Um. <laughs> You're up against so, the, the wall there. The utility commissioners are the problem. They, they're well, part of this information campaign, but I love your ambition, Heather. Keep thank going. Thank you. Well, we have right. one in the audience and if he's up for it, I, I mean, I, I love having discussion with him. And he um, uh, has close alliances with some of the trade groups that you know we are not seeing eye to eye with, and so anyway, I might be have gone a little too far out on the limb, but you know it's kind of just a show of, of um, my spirit here. <laughs> so. Well, uh, it's a it's almost uh, seven forty five, and uh, we want to save a little bit of time for a call to action, and so what we're going to do is we're going to introduce that call to action, which is something that we've been hearing from you all tonight. And then we'll go ahead and stay on for uh, as long as people want to afterwards, and we can open it up to allow some additional questions. Uh, one of the questions that, um, that has come up by a number of participants is, you know, we're seeing a lot of strategies from opponents insisting that the fish are doing fine and on track to recovery and they're encouraging these multi-year studies and making uh, a lot of TV ads. And so uh, we, we wanna know, you know, we wanna work on what we can do to, to counter that. And so I'm gonna introduce to you uh, Patty Kramer from the CEE team, who's going to talk about our call to action tonight. And uh, Patty, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? Patty, Jerry, can you find Patty and? Yes, now uh, it, it was telling me the host would not un let me unmute myself, okay. but the host um, finally did that. <laughs> there we are, there's Patty. Okay, and Patty is a member of CEE team uh, uh, and she's been working really hard on getting this program for you tonight. So Patty, I'm gonna go ahead and let you explain and I'll, I'll put the Google Doc up so people can see the call to action. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay, so um, we are asking that um, attendees who are so moved um, do a particular call to action and that is to contact President Biden um, uh, by either writing a postcard, an email, or a phone call, or all three. Um, what we essentially want Biden to do, what we want to, we want to petition him to immediately breach the four Snake River dams and lower Snake River dams. So you've heard discussions about that tonight, um, about how, how, what, how urgent the situation is, and the fact that he does have the authority to direct the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to begin breaching the dams now. So uh, what we've provided here are talking points that you can use in writing up a postcard or an email or a telephone conversation. Um, you're welcome to use these verbatim or to use them as, as um, you know, launching points uh, for your own words. Um, I'm not, can I, uh, Debbie, can you move the, um, there we go. 
So I won't go through those talking points. That's up to you all to do at your leisure. Um, we're asking you if you're going to use the, you, the postal service, if you use a postcard rather than a letter, I know it seems that those postcards can get kind of flimsy in the mail, but if you write a letter to President Biden, it has to go through several weeks of quarantine before it's open. Um, so a postcard really is the best thing if you wanna send um, something through the post office. And by a postcard, you know, this can be a postcard of your town, your city, it can be a pretty flower, it can be fish, anything you want, it doesn't matter, um, right? Um, well, I mean, postcard size, um, write um, a few sentences. Um, brevity is the, what? Um, the soul of wit, I guess. <laughs> and um, you can follow that up You can you with a phone call. We have the phone numbers there. You can send an email if you want to, to write something longer um, in letter form, go ahead and email it if you'd like, or you can use Twitter. Um, so that's what we're asking tonight is that you contact President Biden directly um, and, mm -hmm. and encourage him, petition him to uh, put out the call, put out the order to breach those dams immediately. For those of you who'd like a deeper dive into today, tonight's topic, which given what I've seen on the chat, Many of you already know a lot about this. Um, what, what we've offered here are a couple of things. For, the first one is a, the, a video in which the Nez Perce tribe describes this plan that they have to replace the power that the four Lower Snake River dams generate. It's nine minutes and I, I guarantee you it's, um, uh, it's inspiring. Um, for any of you who are so moved to write to your state, either Washington or Oregon state legislators, governor, um, representative senators, um, or if you are so moved to write to the White House Council on Environmental Quality, which is Deb Haland, um, Department of the Interior, Brenda Mallory, um, all of those, that contact information is available at the Damn Truth website link that we've provided here. What might pop up when you click that is this pop-up screen that talks about responding to the Inslee Murray report. If you, if, you, if you don't wanna deal with that, you can just click it off and that will take you to the page with all of the contact information, um, which is really easy to access. And then um, we have here a copy of a letter that Jim Waddell wrote to the president. He generously shared this with us and I'm Sure, he probably wouldn't mind if you even use some of his own phrases, um, but it's, um, there's a lot of information in that letter that you might use um, in writing either your postcards or, or a longer email to President Biden. Um, and then the other um, two links are to the Damn Sense website or a, a website that's uh, primarily um, about the, um, the Southern Killer Resident Wales, Southern Resident Killer Wales. Um, so we hope that that's helpful. We're uh, including a link to that, um, to these two pages in the chat. And um, we will email out a copy of this document to everybody who's attended so that you have everything in front of you. You can click on the links, um, you can cut and paste um, talking points and um, get your message to President Biden and any legislators of your choice as soon as possible. Any questions? Hey, Patty, if yeah. I may add. Yeah. Um, having been on the receiving end of this kind of stuff when I worked in the White House, um, people making repeated phone calls, like if there's 30, 40, 50 people that are calling, you know, once or twice a week, that really adds up and that makes it, that's what that mass of uh, calls or postcards or whatever all coming in, but repeated phone calls from the same person is effective too. But that all piles up after a couple of weeks and goes to the communications office in the, in the White House and they look at it and they say, hmm, and that'll make its way to the chief of staff of the White House and up to the Biden, up to Biden. So that's that's the way it works. So make that call. It's kind of fun. Talk to um, the folks that answered phone, tell them who you are and just say you want the dams breach um, starting this year. <laughs> That, thank you, thank you. That's that's really good um, information, and to let people know that you can make as many calls <laughs> and and uh, as you can possibly get through on, and send as many postcards and as many emails, and the more the better. So thanks a lot for that. And uh, several of you have put some links in the chat as well, and we'll follow up with information about 
you know, watching this video again and uh, the recording that we made. So you can view that again as well. And um, we'll get that out to all those who registered today, as well as the links that people have put in the chat. So with that, uh, uh, are there additional questions that or th things that the panelists uh, that we didn't ask that the panelists would like to answer? This is a, a great interview question. You know, is what is the question that you were expecting that we didn't ask? Debbie, one question I see that we didn't cover. Someone asked, um, are these flood control projects? And no, they are not. Um, they were never authorized that way. They have, um, um, they weren't built for flood control. And yet people claim that they do, but that's only because they have a little bit of pool fluctuation that the core can adjust, but that's not for flood control purposes. Their only authorized purpose is uh, hydropower and navigation. And it's 92% of the funding of the dams is hydropower. And therefore it's funded by Bonneville Power Administration, which is very handy for us because this means that the breaching cost and mitigation costs can handle, be handled almost exclusively with non-appropriated funds, i.e. you don't need the federal treasury, nor do you need congressional appropriations. The BPA through pressure from the Secretary of, Defense, uh, um, of Energy um, can pay this, but like we've said, this will not increase rates. This $750 million I'm talking about will not increase rates. Now, if you wanna spend two or 3 billion, that's gonna increase rates a lot because the rate payers will have to eventually cover those costs. Thank you. And that kind of leads to another question that was asked, uh, well, what about some of these other stakeholders um, you know, the, maybe the farmers, if, if there's irrigation involved, um, the river transporters, the barges, uh, is, you've mentioned that it's pretty easy to deal with them. Are there some specific plans that uh, are in the works for dealing with them as well? Scott? Yeah, so, uh, you know, this debate's been going on for over 20 years. You know, Jim's report that he talked about earlier, I read it, and like he said, you know, anybody reads that report, you go, well, it's breach of dams. But, you know, it has to happen. We're still here. Uh, the farmers in the area, the wheat farmers, a lot of them saw the writing on the wall and they just trying to make this delay as long as possible. But they put in uh, rail terminals north of there. More can be put in if need be. Um, we could start breaching right away. Lower Granite is Lewiston. There's great, there's, there's rail tracks there. You know, the power has been replaced. This idea that we need more study, we need more time, we need to negotiate. You know, the Nez Perce should just take them to them with this end of the stay of the litigation and say, we got to do it now. There's no more time because the orca don't have the time. The climate doesn't have the time. We need to recover the salmon. We need to cover the forest. We need to restore the ecosystem. This is just a bunch of hogwash that we're waiting any longer. And, and I threw my email up there, so call me, text me, anybody. Email. Go ahead, Heather. Yeah. Um, just following on to, to what Scott just, you know, rolled out there. Uh, for everybody, for everyone here, don't underestimate the power of contacting any type of agency that is... Um, related to this issue, whether it's fish related, power related, whatever related, trade groups, uh, county councils, anything. Don't underestimate the incredible power of giving them a call, checking out their website, find out how they are intertwined with this. What is their viewpoint, their policy? How much are you paying as a member? Um, you know, we found out here in the San Juan Islands that our utility company is a member of PNGC, which brokers our BPA contract. They, they are partners, like they helped create Northwest River Partners, which is the foremost pro dams lobby here in the Northwest and has um, fundraised their current TV and radio campaign that many people are seeing. Um, and, you know, it's all of you are probably contributing to the 
the deceptive information or information that you disagree with about these dams in some form or another. And it's been business as usual for so long and people are hands off. I think there's a lot of opportunities and low hanging fruit for individuals to show up, just start digging, ask around, call us, email us and start getting involved with the programs that you are a part of, whether you realize it or not. And because it's very easy to feel powerless and all I can do is write postcards and letters. There's a whole lot more you can do. You can run for commissioner for a PUD. You can get on a board. You can have conversations. There's so much you can do. So I recommend let's just get this over the hump. Like Scott said, enough is enough. The Endangered Species Act is the top law of the land. Those dams are in utter violation. We are failing the species. And it is better to roll up your sleeves, do double, triple, quadruple duty right now, and let's just get it over with and get on with our lives. You know? So on that rant, uh, yeah, thank you, everybody. Let me, let me go on that one. Actually, the, the, the top law of the land, um, is, is Article Four of the Constitution tells us what the top law of the land is, and it's actually treaties. And the tribes know this. And when I mentioned the tribes should take it to them on this state of litigation, the tribes have been holding this ace in their hand for a long time, and I've been wondering why they've been silent. I've been involved in this 25 years, and they're going to play this card. They're showing the card now. We need to breach now. The president needs to order. You know, just call up the general, corps engineer, say let's let's get let's get it done um and the the treaty check this out if we break that treaty by not allowing them to have any salmon we gotta give all the land back <laughs> i mean it's uh that's the top law of the land article four constitution <laughs> all the president everybody I bet somebody here knows somebody that knows somebody in the White House. So run that, okay? Somebody on this 120 people. I mean, I know somebody that knows the president, okay? All you guys do too. Nobody's three distance away from everybody. And as someone just pointed in the chat about Northwest River Partners, I guarantee there are many of you who are paying for membership with Northwest River Partners and Kurt Miller, the executive director, is a really affable guy. I mean, just email and say, hey, uh, I'm paying as a member and I'd like my viewpoint understood too. So, you know, people, whatever works for you, but just get in there if, and tell, yeah. If you'd like to hear a counter view to what we said tomorrow at noon, uh, the Tri-City Herald I see is having a thing with their past editor and Rocky Barker. So, uh, and the Tri-City Herald is, that's the big center of Save Our Dams community. They're really afraid of the people that are gonna go and get rid of Grand Coulee and Chief Joseph. And this is just to stop the whole river restoration movement is what a big part of this Save Our Dams movement is. But anyway, a counter view tomorrow is at lunchtime, Tri-City Herald's editor and Rocky Barker from the Idaho Statesman, retired journalist. And do you have a link for people to join that? I'll, I'll look for that real quick. Okay, anything else that one of the panelists wants to add before we close up for the night? Thank you for putting this together, Central Oregon Indivisible. I'm a, I'm a member of Columbia Gorge Indivisible, so uh, this has really uh, been an inspiring thing, I think, for everybody on the panel, and um, thanks for having us, for sure. Great. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, and. And thank you, Stephen, for sharing your wonderful film with us. Sure. Thank you. All right. Good night, and stay night. and watch for our uh, watch for the resources that we'll be sending out following uh, probably probably tomorrow. Thank you so much.